Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about Canadian Apartment REIT. We're going to be going over their overall business, their growth strategy that they've been implementing, and then we're going to wrap up on their stock price. I'll give some perspective on my thoughts on if they're overvalued, undervalued, and what I'm doing with the stock from here. Now if you like this type of content, please leave a thumbs up on the video below and would love for you to subscribe to the video for future stock analyses that we do on the channel. Going into Canadian Apartment REIT's recent results here, you can kind of see that they deliver just over a billion dollars in operating revenues in 2022, about 8% growth, but their funds from operations, their units, and their funds from operations per unit as a result of that are all essentially flat, up 0 to 1%. So 8% revenue growth, flat on profit, flat on um, FFO per share is kind of the, the overall summary. And then another important factor before getting into the business a bit more is their net asset value. So the value of all of their assets um, as they've been audited minus the debt that the company has equates to about $58 a share. And that's an important number to keep in mind as we go through the presentation as well. Now, as we look at the portfolio snapshot, just where this company plays, they are about 85% in Canada, 15% of their business exposure is actually in the Netherlands. And I think lots of that's situated as like student rental, student housing. And they really pivoted there as interest rates there remained very low and they were able to get debt for 1%, 1.5% and leverage that debt um, to build equity and, and maximize returns. It also provides some good diversification from the Canadian market. But ultimately, you're investing in a Canadian residential REIT, as you can obviously tell from this slide. About 50% of the business comes out of Ontario, and then the rest is spread out across Canada, almost as you'd expect. BC, Quebec, um, the number two and three market, followed by a couple percentile in the adjacent provinces. Looking at their average rents, you're talking about 1200 bucks on average per unit. So these aren't extremely luxurious units, um, to, to say the least. They do have a portfolio where they have some higher end units, but this is more kind of middle class rental um, type inventory that you're buying here. In the top, you can kind of see their total inventory of units they own at about 67,000 suites. Um, so this is a very big company, a lot of exposure. Uh, if one building or one unit has an issue, it's really not going to impact the overall results. So you're investing in the biggest residential REIT in the country. Going over into what's really driving rental growth and strong demand on their business um, is really a lot of factors. From left to right, you can kind of see cost of construction, whether it's permits, material costs, labor costs, is skyrocketing. And because of that, the value of the existing properties since supply can't be expanded too quickly is going up a lot and we do have a bit of a rental crisis in in Canada specifically in the bigger markets um, which you know is something that companies like CapRate are working car um, Canadian apartment REIT also known as CapRate is known to be trying to address expanding supply but it's definitely challenging and in the meantime their current assets are even more sought after given limited opportunities outside of um, existing inventory in the market. Post-pandemic returns really talking about lots of people went back, lived at home during COVID in Canada. We have this weird cultural thing where most people in Canada live within an hour or two hours of where they grew up, assuming they're, um, they were born in Canada. So lots of people during COVID took that opportunity to move back in with family, um, save some money. We're seeing a reversion to the mean now on that. Real estate market uncertainty, just housing affordability in Canada is also very tough. And as that's developed, we see lots of people waiting on the sidelines for a crash or something like that before buying, which is prolonging people's rental experience as they can't afford to get into ownership as early. Immigration is supposed to be the biggest demand driving element of the Canadian economy over the next number of years. I think two to three percent population growth a year fueled by immigration and then demographic trends as, as the economy ages as well and, and lots more people are moving out of their 
parents' house. So lots of things moving in the direction of higher supply and lower, sorry, higher demand and lower supply for residential REITs in Canada. In terms of uh, Canadian apartment REITs and how they're allocating their uh, capital and, and focus, from left to right, you can kind of see here, historically, you'll see in their portfolio in the next slide that they do really have a lot of older assets. They call them value add assets where there's opportunity for CapEx to increase rents, but they're really looking at getting higher starting rents because with rental caps and only being able to increase with inflation, they have lots of properties that are currently under, um, under market rents and they're really trying to increase uh, rental rates by just buying newer properties that they can increase rents higher and have higher starting rents to begin with. So you'll see their M&A is really focused on new buildings, more luxury buildings to diversify away from their high exposure to value add, um, the value add portion of the residential industry. The second thing is the NCIB program, the buyback shares. They've periodically seen value in their share count. Remember at the beginning of the presentation, you saw their net asset value is $58 a share. So technically, whenever they're buying their share for below that, they're kind of buying back the company at what they feel are, is technically a discount. So depending on how much the, their share price dips, we've seen them be advantageous. And then debt repayment. Obviously, interest rates have gone up. Um, so it's creating a more challenging operating environment to hold higher amounts of debt. And they're proactively paying off debt as it becomes due as well. Now, just on that last point on value add versus new build, you can kind of see historically they've really focused on value add because it generally has the highest um, cap rates. So 95% of their business in 2017 went down to 89% in 21. And then in 2023, uh, so far it's at 86%. And you see their new builds go from 1% to 10% essentially. So Still a lot of exposure in value add, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing, but I think it would be good to get um, new builds up to a higher percentage of their business. And I think they're working on it. And you can kind of see during their um, M&A, they, they got rid of, disposed of half a billion dollars of value add, added half a billion dollars of new build. So you can kind of see that's the, the direction that they are currently going in over the last few years on the business. And this is just more of that. So as they're seeing a disconnect between the value of their units and the share price, as well as wanting to fuel the new build portion of their business, they've been doing a lot of dispositions on the value add side of their business. You kind of see year built. These are properties that are 50, 60 years old, and they're selling them um, you know, over the last two years, half a billion dollars there. They're taking that money, buying back shares, investing in new apartments um, that you know will be good for the next 20, 30 years at higher starting rents where they don't have rental caps on them like some of those older buildings do. Now looking at just the consistency of this business, you can kind of see month or quarter over quarter over the last two and a half years of just one <clears throat> sorry occupancy rate. I think at the low, despite COVID and everything else, was at like 97%. So back to the initial conversation on very strong demand, very low supply in this industry. And they're, for the, for the, for the current environment, essentially guaranteed high 90s occupancy rates, which really puts their business in a really strong and powerful spot to demand pricing power when new rents come through, um, as well as just ensuring that they continue to be profitable, continue to have assets that are being monetized instead of sitting there empty. And then you can also see, I know interest rates and affordability and other things have come into play here, but just really strong rental growth um, quarter over quarter, trending from about $1,100 a month up to over $1,200 a month in the last quarter. And now one thing here is as interest rates have gone up, it's really fueled more people into renting and the cost of providing rentals has gone up a lot. And that's one of the reasons why they need to charge more. But over the long term for a business like this, I think it is healthy. 
because they are increasing their average monthly rents. But hopefully in the future, interest rates will go back down and it'll just be all margin expansion. You kind of saw how this ended up playing out on the financials on the first slide where, yeah, rents overall net increased 8% on the year, but funds from operation was flat because all of that 8% was swallowed up by higher interest payments, generally speaking. So as those interest payments go down, whether it's behind paying down debt, behind out, uh, capital allocation, or just drop in interest rates, we're going to see all of that incremental rent per month just flow down to the bottom line and fund for, from operations. So a bit painful in the time being as operating costs have gone up with rents. But realistically, I do not think these rents will go down when operating costs revert back to the mean. So that's one thing as I look at this company and, and kind of their multiples. One thing I keep in mind is a potential future tailwind if, if interest rates do stabilize and start to trend down. Now, this is a really interesting slide. Overall, their business had 7 to 8% rental growth, but that's because the vast majority of their business and their units do not turn over every year. And as units turn over, they're able to get up to market rents. Um, but if people stay in their units, lots of their units have rent control, especially in Ontario. They can just charge 2 3 3 3.5% more a year. But what's really promising is you see how big of a gap their average rents are versus their versus the market rent. So when people moved out in the back half of 2022, we saw rents go up 25% as they turned over those units. So this kind of just speaks to the growth trajectory as people move out of units in the future, if they're buying a home or they move out of the province, whatever the catalyst may be but they have a lot of under monetized apartments right now that should continue to provide really good top line revenue growth as they up those apartments to, um, to market rent. So even if only 10% of their apartments turn over or if 10% of their apartments turned over at 24% higher rents without doing anything, no CapEx, no investment, that would be two and a half percent revenue uh, growth for the company and about 5% fund from operation growth on an annual basis if that kind of occurred year over year. So really strong underlying tailwinds that could occur on the business given how under monetized some of their assets are today. And it's like worst case scenario, these people stay in paying under market rent and they're just reliable tenants. We're still making money off of them as, as shareholders and continuing to fuel that monthly dividend. So I think the company is just in a great safe spot from, from that dynamic and that perspective. Now, looking at the stock price, we saw at the beginning, they do a billion dollars in operating revenue, $400 million in net funds from operations, about $2.32.40 a share in funds from operations. Now, their valuations of at about $8.4 billion for the whole market cap of the company and just about 50 bucks a share. So at about $47 a share, this company would be trading at 20 times earnings. I have tend to use that as a, as a good proxy for what I think um, is good value for Canadian apartment REIT. It's really um, a really safe company. They've been paying a dividend for a decade or more than a decade every single month, increasing it on an annual basis by an inflationary amount. So really stable company. They've grown really well over time. They're really well positioned. They have highly sought after assets. And I think they have a lot of growth tailwinds as well, whether that be um, lease turnovers or whether that be interest rates going down, just lots of potential catalysts outside of their capital allocation strategy, which is also creating value that I feel really good paying about a 20 times earnings for this company. So the company, while it was down here in the low 40s recently, I was adding to my position. At the current price, I think it's right about fairly valued. I wouldn't be opposed to buying it here if there was nothing else in my portfolio that um, was calling. Um, but I do really like to target that under 20 uh, times fund from operations. So I'll be looking at this one to dip closer to the mid 40s would be happy to nibble there. I'm not going to get rich off of this company, but it does provide about a 3% dividend that tends to grow annually. 
and should have strong capital appreciation long term, in my opinion. With that being said, I'm not an investment advisor. This is not investment advice just for fun and entertainment. Advise you to or hope you go and look into the company a bit more, do your own research before making an investment decision. But with that being said, please let me know if, if you own this stock, if you're interested in the stock. Would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. If you haven't yet, would love if you hit the subscribe button for future videos. And I'll see you guys in the next one.